May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Amen. She came eager to serve with the best of intentions and a desire to do good. It was a hot and sticky July day in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Molly, along with her co-leader and the church youth group, had just spent the morning clearing debris from a house that was damaged by Hurricane Katrina. Covered in sweat, ready for a rest, they arrived at their next assignment, a new housing development with a park at the center. It was a place where families who had been displaced by the hurricane were now living as they tried to put their lives back in order. Just as the youth set off to play with the local children, Molly set off across the grass where an SUV and a portable trailer with a window awaited her. There, she met Angela a local resident who had also lost her home and her livelihood because of Katrina. Angela also, with the support of a local Episcopal church in New Orleans, was able to start a new business, a portable snow cone shop. <laughs> Climbing into the trailer and as an act of bringing simple summertime joy to the children on a sweltering day, Molly helped Angela prepare the ice and the cups and the syrup for the snow cones. When they were ready, they opened the window of the trailer and began to serve the kids. But what Molly saw before her was not what she expected. Rather than a neat and orderly line of children waiting to receive their treat, a huge crowd of adults interspersed with kids was shoving and was pushing against the trailer, hands and voices raised, shouting out to receive their snow cone. They had great urgency. Molly was shocked. She didn't know what to do. So she did what she had always been taught to do. She attempted to take control of the situation and to restore order. Raising her voice, she shouted out the window to the crowd, children first, get in a single line and let the children be served first. And to her dismay, with every child that came forward, an adult or two came with them. As she tried to manage the crowd, she became more and more irritated. And she thought to herself, what is wrong with these people? Why are these adults so selfish? Can't they see that we are here to take care of the children? Working beside her, Angela was patiently scooping the chafed ice into the cups, pouring the syrup of choice on top, and then handing the cups to Molly, who would hand them off to the children with a napkin and a smile, but not without some visible angst towards the adults. Quietly, Angela leaned in and said to Molly, don't worry, there's enough ice for everyone. And hearing those words, Molly suddenly became conscious of what she had been doing. As she looked out into the crowd, she now not, saw not just people who were greedy and pushy, she saw people whose lives had been altered in unimaginable ways, and who, like any human being, wanted to be fed, wanted to receive. Ashamed and embarrassed, Molly pulled herself together, and she continued to serve the rest of the folks with patience and generosity. We all have times when we think we know how things should be. When we think we know how things should go, 
or what is true. We have times when we think we know what's best for ourselves and what's best for others. Even when we, like Molly, set out with the best of intentions, things that we already know or things we understand to be true or the assumptions that we make about people or situations can interfere with our ability to love and serve others. It can interfere with our ability to extend kindness and consideration. These things, such things like this, get in the way also of our relationship with God. For when we think that what we know and what we believe already is the absolute truth or the only way, we may not be open to the new truths and the new insights that God is giving to us. Over the last many weeks, we've heard from John's Gospel, and it's told us how the Judean people and the crowds around Capernaum have been watching and witnessing and listening to Jesus as he shares with them who he is and how, through God, he is inviting them into a lasting and eternal relationship, one that will give them life beyond that mana, life that will feed their souls. Yet when he likens himself to living bread from heaven, or when he speaks very directly about his flesh and his blood being the true food that they should eat and drink to have this eternal life, their rational and literal brains and minds cannot quite comprehend it. The religious authorities are experts. They are experts on the law and the prophets. They know just how a person is to behave, what rules to follow. They remember how their ancestors were fed by Moses in the wilderness and how God provided for them. They know what is right to eat, they know what sacrifices are pleasing to God. And while they anticipate the day that the Messiah will come, they also expect that it will happen in a certain way. And Jesus is not what they expect. They have lived their lives as most of us do. Going forward into the world with a certain confidence in what we understand to be right and what makes sense to us. That is our human nature. So when Jesus stands before them and speaks of himself as this bread of life, the living bread sent by God through whom hunger and thirst are quelled and by whom all those who see him and believe in him are saved, everything that they think they already know is challenged. And that has to feel confronting. Even as Jesus tries to help them along, his claim that his flesh is real food and drink that gives salvation and that they have to eat it if they want eternal life, it's unnerving. Many of them will find it impossible to bridge this, impossible to let go of their own wisdom and unable or challenged to trust in the mighty work of God that surpasses their understanding. God sent Jesus into the world so that those who trust in God's power to save might be fed, and fed deeply, in body, in mind, in spirit, in ways that fill and satisfy us so completely, in ways that strengthen us for all that God calls us to be, all that God calls us to do, all that God calls us to endure. Surely the distractions of this world and moments when we trust more in ourselves and what we think we already know than in God's wisdom and promises can trip us up. 
sometimes with dire consequences. We may find ourselves like the Judeans, certain that we know and understand who God is or how God works, only to be confronted when God breaks into our lives in a brand new way. It is God breaking in and through us that has the power to transform our lives and the lives of those we encounter along the way. It is the invitation of Jesus to take down the guard of what we know, to dispel the certainties that we have and to open ourselves up as best we can to be witnesses to the new information and the new words of God in our lives. Like the words that Angela spoke to Molly, Jesus reminds us that not only does God provide for us, each and every one of us, but that there is also always enough for all of us to be fed, especially you and me. Amen. <laughs>